Lakeland Public Television presents Currents with host Ray Gildow. Sponsored by Nisswa Tax Service, offering tax preparation for individuals and businesses across from the City Hall in Nisswa and on the web at nisswatax.com. Hello again everyone and welcome to Lakeland Currents where tonight we're going to be talking about a program that's been in effect for quite a while now in Minnesota and has made a huge impact on our natural resources. It's called the TIP program, Turn In Poachers. And with me this evening, I have the new executive director, Dennis McIndance, and with him, uh, a brand new conservation officer, <laughs> just got thrown into the heat of being on TV while his first part of the job, Phil Mose. Thank you guys for being here. Thank uh, you. Did I pronounce that right, Mose? Yes. yes, I did. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, Dennis, let's start out with you. You're just brand new to the job. I am. And how long was the last executive director there? Actually, uh, they've been running without an executive director for a few years. They had an interim unpaid executive director. And prior to that, I think it was like 1990, or excuse me, 2009, when, uh, when Al Thomas was the last executive director. And then that interim uh, non-paid, uh, Doug Bermel was there. So you just started your job when? I started on August 3rd, uh, 2015 here. And um, it's uh, going well. There's a lot to learn, a lot of, uh, a lot of things to, to uh, actually come together and make happen. So. Um, we're we're getting there. We're getting prepared for 2016. Which what is what drew you to this job? You know, actually, it's uh, the history. Um, I was in law enforcement prior to uh, to this. I started out at Alex Tech, uh, did some riding with a conservation officer when I was in high school, and uh, uh, out of the Painesville area, which is uh, your hometown, uh, happens to be mine too. And uh, we did some riding, and I, I thought, you know what, law enforcement is a great career, so I chose that career. Um, I didn't take the path of conservation officer because guess what they have to do? They work every single weekend. That's an opener. Every single weekend? <laughs> well, I mean, every single Just weekend. Just about every weekend. Well, that's an opener or, or what have fishing you. Fishing opener, like, hunting know, openers. I was like, do I want to work every fishing opener or hunting opener? And, um, and at that age, I, I really wanted to be out there for the opener. And I look back now and say, it would have probably been better to be hunting when nobody else is out there. <laughs> so, but anyway, that's, uh, that's how I started uh, the interest within the TIP program. Then I became a paramedic for a few years. And, uh, and then uh, over the last uh, year or so, I've been uh, following a friend of mine who's a conservation officer. And, uh, and he said, you know, the TIP program uh, is looking at getting an executive director. And you might be qualified for that job. So I applied and uh, took the job on August 3rd. Well, congratulations Thank on your you. new job. Phil, let's just talk a little bit about you because you are brand new to the uh, occupation, so to speak. Um, what track did you take to get work to where you're at now? Yeah, similar to Dennis. When I was a kid, I uh, was into the outdoors. My dad got me out hunting quite a bit, and fishing, and uh, growing up in Painesville, I remember in 10th grade, I wrote a paper on a dream job, and uh, I rode with the uh, CEO there who was Chuck Nelson, and uh, wrote the paper, and Chuck had told me, you know what you should do is you should go into the Army do a few years there, get out, become a law enforcement officer somewhere, and then uh, try and uh, become a CO. And 15 years later, that's where I stand. I uh, went into the Army for seven years. And after the Army, I was a cop in St. Paul, Minnesota for the last seven years. And uh, now I'm here. So, that's so you kind of made it's very similar track to Chuck Dennis. Nelson was my conservation officer that I rode with when I was a kid. Wow. <laughs> so it's, a, it it's really interesting a that you were both in law enforcement before you came into this natural resources portion of the law enforcement. That's kind of an interesting twist that both of you have been through. Um, it's a very, very large geographic area that all of you conservation officers are asked to serve. I know because I've worked with conservation officers in the past. Um, so it's a sort of a daunting task when you look at how big of an area you, you really do have to cover. And we can maybe get into that a little bit more. Um, the other thing I was going to ask both of you guys is, um, when you're working in the TIPS program, and you're new to it, I'm so you probably can't answer that, but are you finding more and more people willing to, to work with it? You know, and that's one of the reasons I'm here is that um, up to this point, there's a lot of data that seems to be missing over the last couple of years, and I've come together and, and, and really done some research. And um, the, 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 as far as the number of calls and so on, 
all of that program fundamentals have been going strong and going steady over the last couple of years. And we'll talk a little bit about the five-year averages coming up. But uh, as far as the program itself, um, it's, it's integrated well. And what's important about, to understand about the program and the history of the program is that you know, it's, it's, been, it's 35 years or 34 years old now. Um, it's been around uh, since 1981 when it started. It was an idea based on Crime Stoppers um, and, and wildlife uh, programs for game, game Operation Game Thief, I think was the original name for it. And e eventually it came up to be Turn In Poachers or the TIP program. And um, as it's developed and grown throughout the years, uh, it, one of the things that I've, I've noticed with people and visiting with people is that people think that the TIP program is the DNR, but it's not. Actually, the TIP program, Turn In Poachers, is a nonprofit organization that works collaboratively with the state of Minnesota um, Enforcement Division. So that's a very important aspect I want to make sure that everybody understands is that we are a, a program associated with the Department of Natural Resources, not actually part of the Department of Natural Resources Enforcement Division. I think that's a misconception that most people have, because when you talk to most people, they think it is a state program. It's a conservation program Correct. run by uh, game wardens, conservation officers. So it's important, I think, that you make that distinction today. That's one of my goals for the, for the 2016 year, is to really bring that message out to people and, and know that uh, the TIP program is a, a nonprofit organization and, and uh, towards the end I'll talk a little bit about the plea for some finances and, and some of the things that make the program work and why it's successful and what we do um, and the need for those finances. So let's just talk a little bit more about the history. Um, it is brought forward by a group called the Conference Center for Conservation Association and other concerned sportsmen's groups originally called what you said uh, the operation game. Uh, and it was incorporated in 1981. So historically, how has the money been raised for this historically? Banquets. Through, uh, through banquets and membership. Like a DU banquet. That, like a Ducks, uh, Ducks Unlimited banquet, like an MDHA or Minnesota Deer Hunters Association banquet. Same kind of format. It's sportsmen coming together for a night of fun and uh, some, some gaming pieces and uh, throwing some money into the organization and creating membership. And I know you sent us a number of photos and we'll try to put those into the program as we talk and so you might want to refer to those once in a while we when we get into those uh, folks who got arrested for some of the things that they've done. It's really incredible sometimes when one thinks of the abuse that, that has happened. Uh, for People think maybe it's innocent to catch 30, 40 over the limit of sunfish but when you look at what some of these groups have done it's been, it's been a huge number. Significant numbers. And my sense has always been I live in a rural area, and north of me, I've always heard these rumors of people who are getting deer in the fall. And my sense has always been that there are some neighbors who are maybe even afraid to call and say that we suspect there's been something going on here at night. We see lights out in the field. We hear a shot. But I think it's important to talk about how there's really... Uh, anonymity in this program when someone calls. That is correct. There's two ways. I mean, there, actually, one of the things also about the uh, the the, report, the program is the reward program, and that's really what um, motivated the uh, the founders of this organization. Is that you know what? Let's offer people an incentive, um, and that is the uh, offering them a reward. And a part of that also was the anonymous piece. And you're you're issued a number through uh, when you make that phone call and you're a number rather than a name, and that's where the anonymous part comes into play. So if I called in and a neighbor is shooting deer, there's no chance that they're going to find out who I am. No. That is, so they, People can make assumptions as that, you know sure. what, the only one that saw me was that person. Right. Um, and those are the assumptions that I think that people make. But then it, it's a matter of, of saying, you know what, I, we need to stop the cycle. And, I, and I'll talk about one of the cases that actually was a cycle of a person doing many, many uh, violations throughout a series of years and, and how that tip actually came to uh, bring that person to, to justice, basically. So as you're in your first year now as the executive director, how many uh, banquets do you plan to try to put together? I'm, I'm going to start with a couple um, to get my feet wet. Uh, we've already done uh, one event here at Camp Ripley. Uh, we're uh, down 
showing the wall of shame and doing a fundraiser event down there um, over the next, next couple of weeks here. And also, uh, I'm going to try to put a couple of uh, banquets together earlier in the season, early in 2016. And then after that, again, celebrating 2016, and, and uh, I, I don't think we've talked about it yet, but the 35th year of, of the Turning Poachers program, uh, I'm really getting excited about uh, all the different events that I want to attend and or uh, engage people, volunteers, to help us attend and, and really spread the message about the Turn-In Poachers program. So where do you, do you have any idea of what, what part of the state you will probably be offering those kinds of programs? Uh, actually, the goal is to hit them all, hit, hit all, all the corners of the state. And one of the, the culmination, believe it or not, it's September 1st of 20, uh, 1981 when the, uh, when the signing was done, and it's during the state fair. Okay. And uh, what we want to do is we want to really kind of culminate because it's the great Minnesota get together and I, I, I want to be able to use the, the media piece to, to bring those people together and, and really celebrate it on September 1st during the state fair this year. We were talking a little before we came on air here and, and I know that sometimes when you get a tip and Phil, I, you obviously haven't been doing this so you probably have talked to fellow officers but it isn't something you can always prove right away, is it? It might be something that is going to go on for a while before evidence is collected to see what happens. Yeah, first I'd start out by saying I've been in the field now, this will be my third week, and already received tip complaints. Really? So, so it's happening and it's, uh, people are using the system. Um, one thing that I would convey to them is if you're using it, realize that you may not get any feedback initially or as soon as you'd like. And it's something that uh, a case takes time to develop. And then on top of development, oftentimes we can't disclose information until it's complete and final. And the convictions have had their time to run their course. Um, when we receive these complaints, I know a lot of people don't want to give their name, but yet they want to be involved, but realize that once we're investigating it, we, won't, we don't want that person involved at all either, because we want to keep that you know, feeling of being anonymous and not being involved with it. It's uh, something that I relate back to my previous law enforcement career is using informants to gather information. And uh, with the reward that TIP offers, it, uh, it increases that person's likelihood to maybe give us the information that we need. And uh, I know the Sherburn case, it's, it's not going to happen maybe overnight that we act on something. But two years down the road, we may remember, hey, we received this TIP two years ago that seems awfully similar. We can go back, look at it, and say, hey, wait a minute, we need to look at this person and uh, maybe find a suspect in that avenue. So, so my, I, my sense would be that most people don't turn in violators to get the reward. Would that be a fair statement or isn't that a fair statement? It's probably a fair statement. And the reason why is because the monetary fund is not, it's, it's by law and by, by uh, the legislature for uh, uh, small game violations, fish, and up to deer, it's uh, anywhere but from 100 to 250 dollars. So it's not a lot of money, but it is an incentive. And um, another reward that we can give you too is as kind of a memory thing. If you, you know, and some people are very proud of the fact that they were able to turn this person in, they finally got caught. Uh, we have a, a, a picture program. You can uh, get a print uh, from our collection of prints over the last 30 years and uh, we give you that as a reward also so it's not even many times it's not about the monetary thing mm -hmm. so when you're getting tips this type of uh, time of the year is it usually related to fur bearing feather bearing things or is it still fishery kinds of issues I'd say right now this time of the year it's kind of a mixed bag everything's coming in right now it's the busiest time of the year for us and fishing is still hot and uh, now with the big game season right around the corner and it's, uh, it's picking up and uh, then the fur bearings come in here too where guys are getting out a little ahead of the game. And so, but yeah, right now is the busy time of the year for us. And, and there, I know on your wall of shame, there have been some people caught who seem to have a history of doing this. Uh, there are others who are probably doing it because they don't think they'll ever get caught, but that, can, that habitual violator I think a lot of people say, why don't they get hit harder? Why don't they get really whacked? Well, you can take their guns, you can take their, their pickups or whatever. That's, that's pretty significant, I think, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it definitely sets an impact. I think, you know, if we find somebody, well, they got to pay a monetary fine. But when we're able to go in and say, you know what, that rifle that you use to take that deer that's been handed down to, from you, to you from your grandfather, 
that sends an impact that says, oh man, I lost this precious piece that I've cherished my whole life, mm -hmm. and then now it's gone because I went and committed an illegal act. So that sends more of a message to them. And, and I know that the DNR has had auctions where, where things that have been confiscated. Does that money go back to the DNR or does that go back to tips? It goes back into the Game and Fish Fund. Okay. And that's just used for other issues that you've got there. Yep. So what are some of the big violations that we've seen in the history of this program? You know, this, this about two weeks ago we received a bear that came from over in Wadena County. Uh, and that, just to kind of put into perspective how long a case can take to develop and how long it takes for us to actually have that information for the public, for us to share with the public, it, uh, this was a case from 2013. Um, it was a situation where a gentleman uh, harvested a bear in his backyard uh, in, a no, in a quota area using a no-quota tag um, and was eventually convicted of that crime. And the, the confiscation occurred, and um, it's a big, beautiful bear, and, um, and we'll be displaying that in our wallet. So you had it all stuffed? And it's, it was all mounted and uh, brought to a taxidermist, and, and everything was, you know, we, we make sure we track everything, how, how the information and how that animal is, uh, is brought forward. And, and then eventually, uh, again, we display it for the public to see through the walls of shame that we have. And I know one of the photos you sent us uh, was of a lot of panfish. Could you talk a little bit about that case? Well, there, uh, that <coughs> actually, me. the case that you saw, the picture <clears throat> that you saw are from an older case, but there was a new case in 2015 from up in <clears throat> Cormorant Lake that really hit the media hard, and that was uh, 676 panfish over the limit. Uh, over the limit. Over the limit. So they caught over 800 fish between all of them in that in that given week. And and again, um, that's a significant, significant case and a and a significant dent within you know taking from others. And that's really the key message here is that you know when somebody poaches, they're taking it from others. And uh, and another case, the one the the case from uh, Goodhue County. Uh, which, which is the famous Cannon Falls buck. Everybody, I think everybody who's seen the Wall of Shame has seen is the Cannon. Is that the eight-pointer? That's the, that's the big eight-pointer. <clears throat> um, I've heard stories of people. People have come to me and said, you know, uh, I, I know the person who, where that land was from. Um, I know somebody who watched that deer for years. They were watching that deer, watching him develop in age and size and mass, and they were waiting for their opportunity uh, to be able to harvest that animal legally. And um, this young man or this person took that from those individuals. And just, it, it happens all over the state like that. And, and unfortunately... And that was a world-class... That's a world-class buck. It's buck. the world's largest eight-point buck, symmetrical eight-point buck to, to in existence today. Wow. Not that there won't be a bigger one or that, that there isn't a bigger one out there that hasn't been registered yet. But uh, the point is, is that that was a world-class buck. And those, those are the things, you know, coming, kind of going back to the fine thing, I think Governor Dayton uh, last year uh, wanted to do some things with the legislature in, in increasing those fines, but I think it kind of died out. And, and, and those are the things we need to regenerate and bring back and say, let's, let's give it more than an incentive to lose the gun or the family heirloom. Let's talk about some financial stuff too, the impact. So I think other parts of the country are doing that, and I think it's a good thing for us to start looking at and potentially, you know, putting all the players in one place and, and looking at it and saying, we can do this. We can do a better job of, of deterring people from doing it and so, making them think so twice. So what are some of the other, that was one of the highest profile cases, certainly Correct. in the last few years. What, what are some of the other high profile cases over the 35 year or 34 year uh, history of this organization. Let's talk about, he, he alluded to the Sherburn County case, um, and that's another one that's a very interesting case in that it was a series of years that this one developed. Um, when they made that arrest this last year, there was 13 antlers, 13 sets of antlers that were confiscated from this, from this gentleman, um, and it was basically what he was doing was using, using the lending and borrowing method. Um, you know, in the state of Minnesota, we're fortunate enough to be able to have party hunt. It's, it's, a, it's actually a gift, because when I go to Colorado to, uh, to hunt uh, for elk or anything else, once I harvest my animal, I'm done. I, once I harvest the animal, I, I went on a hunting trip one time, <laughs> harvested my animal at 10.30 in the morning on the first day of the trip, and I had to put my gun away mm -hmm. for the rest of the trip. In Minnesota, we don't have to do that. We have the opportunity to be able to party hunt so that if the three of us are hunting together, we have the ability to share tags as long as we're within you know, a, a distance where we can communicate and we're hunting a field together, uh, the law allows us to do that. Well, in this case, the gentleman, he was not doing that. He was out by himself. He was hunting and admitted to harvesting 13 animals um, over a series of years. 
um, and they were confiscated. And if you were at the State Fair this year uh, to see the wall of shame at the State Fair, we actually put that on one wall, and his whole story was on, actually got one whole wall of the wall of shame. So they were all taken illegally? All of them were, were registered, or taken and, and or registered unlawfully, yes. Were they illegally. mostly shot in, at night then? I, I cannot answer that question. <clears throat> I'm not that involved in that, you know, as, that, as far as the details of the case, but I do know that all of them were admitted to, and, and you know, he wouldn't have let us take them if they, <laughs> if they were shot legally, mm -hmm. so, uh, shot legally, so. They, wow. were, they were confiscated, and, and again, they're displayed on the wall, and they're, they're in our wall of shame. So it's, a, it's an interesting story, and it's one that, uh, that I think is, is one that needs to be shared a lot, as mm -hmm. much as we can, to, hope, to help people think twice about taking that animal and then calling that friend for the tag or what have you. Uh, what percentage of people who do violate our laws are from out of state? Is that a small percent? You know, statistically, I don't know that. Again, being new to the position, uh, those are the things that I'd like to know and kind of learn. I don't know, if, Phil, if you have any idea. Yeah, I couldn't give you any statistics on it myself either, but I'd say that, you know, just probably mostly local residents. Mostly I mean, Minnesota. people thinking that they can get away with it mm -hmm. on their property or whatever, and uh, I'd say that's where most of it's mm -hmm. happening. Well, let, let, let's talk a little bit about membership. How do you become a member? Do, and you have members yes, we of do. membership similar to, is it like a DU bank? Like a Ducks you? Unlimited or, <clears throat> uh, again, like Minnesota Deer Hunters Association. Why I say, why I keep kind of referring to the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association is because TIP actually kind of uh, melded in with the Minnesota Deer Hunters Association oh, for really? a while. And, and they helped out, um, you know, with some of the administrative things. So, uh, their office was stationed in Grand Rapids for a while. And back, actually, in fact, now it's uh, here on the Wise Road in Brainerd. Um, we've taken over the uh, Paul Bunyan Nature Learning Center, a great little facility for us to be there and, and show, showcase our wildlife and show, showcase a bunch of different things as far as the outdoors um, over at the Paul Bunyan Nature Learning Center. But um, as far as the, the bigger picture um, for TIP, uh, it's a statewide program and, and it really is. Uh, it, it's affected from Caledonia to the southeast and up to War Road and um, uh, up in the northwest. So when you're a member, what do you get? Um, as a member, and this is where I, I at this point, it's, we do a newsletter, we uh, um, give you a commemorative knife, and, uh, and keep you informed. It's basically become part of the, the membership um, tipster, which is our, our quarterly newsletter that talks about cases and the need for those cases and where, and where those dollars are going and, um, and who it's supporting within the uh, you know, all the information that's, uh, that we're able to share, as, as he had talked about. There's much information we can't share or that he can't share from a, from a legal standpoint, mm -hmm. but when it, when it becomes available to us for public, we actually uh, are able to bring it out from a, uh, an educational standpoint. It's probably frustrating, but it's nice at the same time that you don't have to go knocking on the legislature's door all the time for money, but you do have to knock on everybody else's door for money. Right. What kind of a budget are you looking at annually for your operation? Well, and that's again the the, the new part to this is that um, I'm all, I'm a part-time executive director, uh, part-time paid. Um, so we're building that budget uh, right now. It looks like to be about a forty to fifty thousand dollar annual budget with all with uh, our administrative costs and the educational pieces. The other thing is just just as an example, uh, the bear that we just got returned from the from the uh, tax thermos, the bill was over $400 and that's again a cost incurred by the tip program. So so when those things come, so you had, not, you had to pay for the We have to pay for that. <laughs> yes. That's correct. So that that comes out of tip dollars or donated dollars and that reward fund is really what what drives us all to do that and, and make they make that happen and uh, I did put together some five-year averages um, for uh, for the program and um, with the total number of tip calls on average for the last five years is about 1600 calls per year now taking that data and then dropping that down to making it arrest the average number of arrests within that time frame was just just under 270 arrests for that year now the important part about that is is that those arrests would not have been made, probably uh, not have been made without that TIP program, um, and and bringing those conservation officers uh, to that focal point. And this is this might be a great time for Phil to talk a little bit about the size of their service areas and what they do, as far as why the program is important to all of us. Yeah, there's about 150 field officers, and uh, their stations are about 600 square miles. So you picture a, a department 
Like, well, we're not sharing that so people can know they can get by with something. <laughs> right. <laughs> no. Well, and we challenge them that programs with the tip and then the communities that we work in that we'll probably find out. And, uh, you know, you look at a large police department, there may be 300 street cops in the metro. And uh, an area that's a lot smaller than 600 square miles, well, mm -hmm. here we are, and we're out there one person dealing with 600 square miles. And through the help of people calling in from TIP, we're able to maybe focus our efforts where they need to be and uh, identify possible targets that are out poaching. So it helps hugely. That is a very, very large geographic area, and I have ridden with conservation officers, and I know if you're in one part of the area and you get a call from another, that's a long ways to go. And sometimes there are emergency issues. The, it's a, that's a long ways to travel, so it's a very challenging job. Are your numbers, with your graduating class that just finished in Minnesota, are you about where you need to be with um, numbers of officers, or are, th are there still areas where you have openings? Yeah, I think we're still short. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is by, I think, 2018, about 24% of the field is eligible for retirement. Wow, so, it's so you're gonna have another big turnover coming down the road. Yep. yep. Wow, so. now when, you're, when you say you're short, is that short because of funding issues from the legislature or are you waiting for more people to come through the program? That's a good question. Guy yeah. at my level probably doesn't know the okay. exact answer, but I'm sure it's a mix of both. Okay, so, okay. so now we're down to our last minute or so here. When someone calls TIP, how do they do it? TIP uh, can be called 1-800-652-9000. Uh, 9-3, which is, uh, I think we'll be putting that up mm -hmm. on the board. Um, you can also call, if you have your cell phone, it's pound tip. And also, if you uh, are sitting at home and you think, maybe I should make that, make that call or make that, I'm, I'm going to do it. So you can actually get it at, uh, you can report a violation on www.turninpoachers.org. Um, so there's really three ways to make that. The so you have a website, you have your phone system. Correct. Uh, and what's the third way? The, 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 well, the cell phone system. Okay. The cell phone, the regular phone, and uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the website. Great. Well, thank you both for coming on board. It's a great program, and I, I really have believed in this program for a long time, and I know it's done a lot of good things, taking some of the people out of the woods that don't belong in there, doing some of the things they've done. So good luck in your new job, Dennis. Thank you. And good luck in your new job, Phil, too. Thank you. So you guys are both look forward to working with you down the road. Thanks. You've been watching Lakeland Currents, where we're talking about what you're talking about. I'm Ray Gildow. So long until next time. Mm -hmm.